Hello, everybody. Um, again, thank you for joining us tonight uh, for this screening of Understory and the Q&A that we're going to have afterwards. Um, really looking forward to the event. And it's also a great night just to be inside. Hopefully you're, uh, you've got a wood stove going or your furnace is running well or you've got a nice blanket around you. But it's a good night to be inside and, and watch this really incredible movie. And we, we hopefully will have some great Q&A at the end. Uh, just want to say we're we're standing trees. We're using a new Zoom platform tonight for this event, and please bear with us if we hit any bumps in the road as we move along for the first time. Uh, my name's Mark, and I'd like to tell you uh, take a few minutes to tell you about standing trees. <coughs> just don't know about us. Uh, we're a newly formed group, and that works. We're dedicated to protect and restore uh, forests on federal and state lands in Vermont. We came together uh, because of the increased logging that's happening in the Green Mountain National Forest and on some of our state forests. Um, I frequently get asked by people, why do we want to focus on protecting federal and state lands? Uh, this is a very good question. So I thought I'd share just a few of the reasons why uh, we work on this. Uh, one is there are a ton of recent studies out there that demonstrate that old wild forests are more resilient to changes in climate change than forests that are actively managed. Old and wild forests preserve the greatest levels of biodiversity. They store more carbon, they trap more water, they remove large amounts of excess nutrients like phosphorus, and they reduce the impacts of extreme precipitation events, which are happening more and more to us, unfortunately, here in Vermont. Um, and federal and state lands, federal and state public lands, they cover about 20% of Vermont. And those lands, they constitute the state's largest blocks of conserved and intact forests. And they're held and they're managed for the public trust. The Green Mountain National Forest in particular is home to the largest roadless areas in Vermont and harbors one third of all the highest priority conservation target areas as identified in the uh, 2018 Vermont Conservation Design Report. Vermont's forests and wetlands uh, that are held and managed uh, by federal and state government, they're among the oldest and most carbon dense ecosystems in Vermont. They protect critical headwaters for the Connecticut and Hudson River and for Lake Champlain. And most importantly, what I think is very uh, important that we never forget is that these old and wild forests, and I'm gonna say old and wild and recovering forests because we don't really have many old forests in Vermont. We've got recovering forests which we have the opportunity to leave them in a wild state and let them grow old. But those forests, they're critical to the health of the animals and plants that live in them. And we need to be their voice to protect these forests. So given these unique qualities that I just went over fairly quickly, it makes the most sense to begin the process to get our federal and state lands uh, to be managed differently, to, to go about using proforestation. And we need to have a paradigm shift in how our federal and state lands are managed, starting here in Vermont, but eventually nationwide. So that's why Standing Trees works to protect federal and state forests and why we think it's important. What we do is as a group, and we are a fairly new group, um, we work to educate people about the importance of old forests. That's done through events like these. Uh, we make them aware of the logging that's happening and, and more being planned on our on Vermont federal and state forest lands. And we provide folks with actions that they can take to make their voice known. And Zach will be talking about one of those actions here in a little bit. So before I pass the mic to Dan, uh, I want to do two things. One, I will re remind you that we've got another educational coming up, educational event coming up on Thursday, March 24th at 7 p.m. And Judy Dow is gonna join us and talk to us. And Judy is uh, a wonderful person and always, um, uh, I learned so much from Judy about caring for the land. Uh, Judy's an Abenaki educator and community leader, and she's been a forest champion throughout the whole process of developing Vermont's climate action plan. Uh, and really looking forward to her uh, being at our next event. So watch for an email uh, with the link to RSVP for that event. Um, and then one last thing before I hand this to Dan, um, if you have questions during the event, we are going to have Q&A at the end. Please use the Q&A icon that's at the bottom of your screen. Click on that. Put your questions in the Q&A box. 
Uh, we're going to be monitoring them and we'll do our best to get all the questions answered. So with that, I'm going to hand the, the mic over to Dan. Again, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you for caring about forests. Um, together we can make our voices heard. Dan? Thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Batten, and I'm uh, uh, very proud to be a volunteer for the Standing Trees organization. Um, in addition to uh, doing things online like this, we're all very accustomed to being in our little Zoom boxes these days. But it is also very important for us when, uh, when possible uh, to safely gather out, uh, outdoors as well in physical space so we can see each other and we can make our voices heard. Uh, out, in the, out in the real world as well as the digital world. And to that end, we're going to have uh, an event on uh, Saturday, February 5th. That's two Saturdays from now uh, in Burlington uh, at the Church Street side of uh, the Burlington City Hall. And uh, there we're going to um, have a little skit. We're going to dress up as trees. You're very welcome to come dressed as a tree. Uh, we will have a few speakers. Um, uh, Representative Amy Shelton, who's uh, just introduced Bill H-606 in the Vermont legislature, uh, which will um, uh, protect, conserve 30% uh, of Vermont's lands by 2030 and 50% by 2050. Also, Representative Brian Cena will be there. Uh, and uh, Brian has recently uh, introduced uh, H-651, which will um, set up an environmental uh, justice uh, component to the state uh, government system. Uh, so two uh, wonderful speakers working on very important work and, and Standing Trees own uh, Zach Porter will be there as well. Um, so uh, please check uh, the Standing Trees uh, website uh, or Facebook post, uh, Facebook page for uh, details on that. You can also, we'll put a link in the chat as well to uh, a website that um, discusses one particular area in the Green Mountain National Forest called Telephone Gap that we would really like to um, have the Forest Service uh, not log. Uh, currently, they're on target for uh, creating a proposal in April uh, that may uh, put about 11,000 or more acres uh, under, under the, uh, the chopping block, and we want to be able to stop that from happening. Um, so the, the couple of months that we have between now and then, we want to raise our voices to the Forest Service and to Congress to um, get the telephone gap to be uh, preserved and saved. Um, so uh, more details will be uh, in the website uh, that we'll put in the chat here, uh, but I'm going to pass it over to Zach and get ourselves going toward the movie. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm just going to see if I can. All right. Um, it's great to uh, have you all here tonight. Thanks everyone for being a part of this event uh, this evening. Um, you know, Standing Trees first and foremost is a community. It's a family of wild forest lovers and ad activists, advocates. Um, and so there's a big part of me that is sad that the way that Zoom webinar works, it makes it challenging to see all of you and for you all to see one another. And I just wanted to acknowledge that right up front because um, in our, you know, world right now where we all have to kind of retreat to our, uh, you know, living rooms and offices to zoom into these meetings, I wish the least that we could do is see each other easily. Um, someday we'll be able to do this kind of thing in person again. And uh, until then, um, we're just really glad that you're here and know that you're over a hundred, one of a hundred people in this family of wild forest, uh, activists, um, who's here tonight to join this film uh, screening, and we're just real so so grateful that you're here tonight. Um, I wanted to just say a few words um, before we get rolling, and then I'll hand it over in a second here to the real star of the evening, uh, Natalie Dawson. Um, but you know, uh, this has been a pretty amazing uh, uh, ride at Standing Trees over the last uh, couple of years since the idea was hatched and concerned citizens like you started to band together. And we've really put our roots down. Um, we're in a new phase of, of standing trees as of this last fall with a staff person. I'm very, very grateful to, to be representing you all um, as the new director of standing trees as of, as of late fall. And our work has just taken off. 
Um, for the first time in, in years, wild forests are a topic of conversation with the congressional delegations in New Hampshire and Vermont, where we focused our energy so far in both of those states, at the state houses in Vermont and New Hampshire for the first time in many years. And we're starting to have an impact on the ground. The White Mountain National Forest um, just recently uh, decided to delay implementation of a project uh, that would have started logging around the spectacular Lake Tarleton area, the largest lake in the White Mountain National Forest. Um, they decided to press pause because of your activism and uh, are going to reopen the public comment process. So stay tuned for the opportunity to weigh in on that uh, process coming up here. Uh, meanwhile, over here in Vermont, as Dan mentioned, um, there is a horrific project in the works called the Telephone Graph Integrated Resource Project. Um, Natalie Dawson is going to be talking to you and this movie that we're going to be watching tonight is all about mature and old growth forests and about roadless forests, large expanses of, of wild forests where there are no roads. These are the places that we need the most in the face of climate change to rise up to the challenges uh, that we've got coming our way, uh, to rise up to the extinction crisis. This Telephone Gap project is targeting a 16,000 acre roadless area that is unprotected by the 2001 roadless rule. And not only that, this forest actually is among the oldest in the state of Vermont. It might not sound that old to somebody like Natalie coming to us from Southeast Alaska, but um, if you can believe it, uh, about 60% or so, make sure I got my numbers right, 55% of this 11,000 acre area that's proposed for logging is over 100 years old, which for Vermont is, is pretty remarkable. And we aren't gonna let these trees get cut because they are on the cusp of finally getting the characteristics of an older forest. So it's at this moment that these trees uh, are, are being kind of targeted for their, uh, their merchantable value that we really need to keep them standing. Um, this is when they're just starting to hit their stride. So we're glad you're here tonight to learn more about the threats to the Tongass National Forest. And when we get into the questions and answers afterwards, um, we'll also dig into the similarities between what's going on in the Tongass and actually what's going on right here in, in New England. Um, both the Pacific Northwest and Southeast Alaska and New England have a lot of, I think, characteristics that would surprise people uh, to have in common. And so we'll, we'll dig into that after the film. But first, let me introduce um, Natalie, who is somebody I'm, I'm, I feel lucky to call a friend. Um, she's the director of, of Audubon, Alaska, um, and she is an amazing activist, scientist, educator. Um, I got to know her personally, as well as another one of the stars of this film, uh, Mara Menahan, who both lived in Missoula uh, with me for a number of years, um, doing great work for Wild Places there. Um, and it is a thrill to have her here in New England with us tonight. Um, it's great that she could she can she can zoom in um, from several thousand miles away to tell us all about this incredible landscape. Um, and uh, she is a a a a true uh, wilderness champion. And 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 I think the word that was used in the film is badass. And that's exactly the the word that comes to my mind when I think about Natalie. So um, thank you so much again to all of you for being here tonight. Thank you to the Standing Trees volunteers and donors who have gotten us off the ground. Um, and I'm forgetting, I, I nearly uh, moved forward without making a really important ask of you all. Um, we're going to share in the chat a link to a petition that is going to our congressional delegation and the forest supervisor of the Green Mountain National Forest, John Sinclair. Tonight, before the night is over, we want you to go to this petition and sign it and get a letter sent off to the decision makers who have the power to stop the Telephone Gap Integrated Resource Project from going forward. So please tonight, follow the link, add your name, and, and, and join the movement to keep the Green Mountain National Forest wild, keep these special roadless areas, these mature forests that are on their way to becoming New England's old growth, keep them wild. So um, I'm gonna just, yeah, stop there. Thanks again, um, and, and over to Natalie. Thanks so much, Zach. And um, yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. 
Thank you to the Standing Trees community for um, being willing to spend an evening with our story in Southeast Alaska on the Tongass National Forest. Um, and I would like to echo Zach's sentiments about not being able to gather in person. It's been so hard over the last couple of years in advocacy to keep the light shining while we've all been sequestered in homes and within uh, small areas in our communities. Um, but this work is still so important. And so I, I love any opportunity to join with others to share in the spectacular magnificence of our wild places. Um, just to introduce the film a little bit and my role in it, um, I'll, I'll give you a tiny bit of backstory. I first met Elsa Sebastian, who's one of the producers and stars of the film in 2017. I had been working in Southeast Alaska for about 15 years as a wildlife biologist, um, studying endemic small mammals. I worked on particularly the weasel family, um, uh, species like marten, which uh, you have in New England as well, um, and looking at how distinct they were on these different islands. And pine marten um, are an old growth obligate species. They require old and mature forests for a certain part of their life cycle, for denning, um, and then also for a winter habitat. So it was through these weasels that I really got to know and understand the forests of Southeast Alaska. Um, the film will talk a lot about them, so I'll, I'll save a lot of the information for the question and answer. But one thing that I think is particularly remarkable about the Southeast Alaska and, and the place you're going to learn about in the film is that it's an island archipelago. So there's several thousand islands scattered in this remote area of Southeast Alaska um, where, I, where I live as well as work. And each of those islands is distinct, some with you know, eight to 900 year old trees, some with big glaciers. And each of those systems is kind of a system within a system. And it makes fragmentation even more challenging because um, these islands are often isolated with small wildlife populations trying to sustain themselves in an already challenging natural environments. So I really got to conservation through these islands. Um, they taught me a lot. Uh, they taught me how to be an advocate um, and they helped me find home. So I live in Haines on the lands of the Tlingit on um, what's called Tlingit Ani, the land of the Tlingit people, the Chilkut and Chilkut, uh, Chilkat Kwan, the two tribes that are the traditional stewards of the lands in which I live. Um, the town I live in is Haines. The Tlingit name is Deshu or end of the trail. Um, and so I, I look forward to hearing from all of you after the film um, and uh, am so excited that you're uh, here tonight to listen to the story. Great, thanks Natalie. Okay, everybody, we're gonna start up the film. Um, hopefully this all runs smoothly. Well, it'll go about 40 minutes. Um, and so at approximately 8 p.m., our Q&A will kick off um, and we'll have lots of time for discussion at that point. So uh, hang tight and we'll get started. All right, everybody. Thank you, and we will get this Q&A rolling. Um, let me just get Natalie and myself up here. Um, that is a powerful film, and uh, not the first time I've seen it, and it brought tears to my eyes again, and uh, I think it will every time I watch it. Uh, I'm sure for many of you in the audience, it did, it did the same. Um, and just want to make sure everybody out there in Zoom land um, is uh, able to see us and hear us okay. I think we're good. Um, and so just to start us off, um, Natalie, do you want to uh, bring us to the present? Clearly, January 24th, just a few days ago, was an important date. Um, but, but help us uh, kind of understand where we are now. Yeah. Um, happy to. So um, with support of so many people and organizations around the country, we were able to submit as a 
collective of people who care about the Tongass National Forest, um, over 175,000 comments, um, which is great, in support of permanently protecting the Tongass by reinstating the roadless rule. So that's kind of step one, right, is to undo the bad that was done during the Trump administration. Um, but it's only the first part. Reinstating the roadless rule gives us some protections for roadless areas on the Tongass, but it's not everything because a lot of our mature forests and some of our old growth forests are not in roadless areas. They're in places that there were roads. Um, and so we're also asking for um, additional protections for habitat through reinvestment strategies with the USDA Forest Service that stops the subsidies that I mentioned in the film. Um, there's currently a budget item that's reappropriated every year that gives um, over $20 million to the US Forest Service for timber harvest in Southeast Alaska. Those are our funds, <laughs> our taxpayer dollars going to subsidize logging. And so we've been working with the Forest Service with our partners to advocate for redistribution of those funds for restoration that's much needed in a lot of the forest. There's over 4,000 miles of roads in the Tongass National Forest, um, much of them in disrepair, blocking salmon streams. So we're asking for kind of a larger outlook for the Tongass in the future. Um, and there's also a push to codify all protections for national forest roadless areas around the country with the Roadless Area Conservation Act, which continues to find life in Congress, um, though its passage is very uncertain. So that's where we're at right now. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. And thanks to everybody out there who answered our call to action um, to join in, you know, with Audubon Alaska and others in submitting those, you know, 100 and I think you said 75,000 comments or some odd, which is fantastic. And, and just so everybody knows, you know, the roadless rule when that was promulgated in 2001 received more comments than any other rulemaking process in the history of, of, of government rulemaking here in the US. Um, any type of rule, not just related to, you know, environmental um, issues. And so uh, the roadless rule has incredible support. We're talking, I mean, at the, at the time, I think it was in the millions of comments that were submitted. Um, and so, uh, and, and Natalie, you're reminding me, you know, of course, uh, you know, the Forest Service, a lot of people don't know, manages more miles of road than any other government agency in the world, not just uh, here in the United States, but it is the largest manager of roads, uh, period. Um, and it's those roads as, as you've been talking about and, and you know, uh, made clear in the film that, uh, you know, lead to so much of the, uh, well, of course, they facilitate the logging itself, but the roads themselves, uh, you know, uh, contribute a tremendous amount of sediment, they, you know, fragment habitat um, on, on down the list. So um, thank you for bringing it to the present. Um, and, and maybe, you know, tell us a little bit more, if you would, about um, the, you know, uh, unique role of old growth forests, and not just old growth, but the importance of allowing mature forests to, uh, you know, to grow old. Um, and what is, what is the kind of opportunity that we have in front of us right now to shift um, management in that way? Yeah, um, great question. So as we talked about in the film, um, there's often this, you know, uh, idea out there that, you know, you can just plant trees and they sequester carbon. And it's true, like a young tree sequesters a lot of carbon. But what research actually shows is those old trees, um, those 800, 900 year old trees, or even three or 400 year old trees on the Tongass, that largest 1%, the oldest 1% of trees actually holds over 50% of the stored carbon. And that's just in the standing trees. The other thing that's often not talked about in old and mature forests is the structural components of an aged forest that include all of the biomass on the ground. Those down trees, um, those old logs that we know are so important for habitat also store an incredible amount of carbon. We um, see a lot of estimates of how much carbon does a forest contain in this country. And it's a lot of them are probably underestimated because we don't really look at that stored carbon. And in old and mature forests, what you have is a system that's evolved over time 
to store large amounts of carbon and hold it in a relatively stable environment. And that stable environment is a carbon storage um, capacity for us, but it's also helping us with overall climate structuring as well, cooling and providing precipitation, holding moisture in, in a drought year, um, things we've probably all experienced when we've walked through these old forests. Yeah, and you're reminding me of some of those um, similarities between the forests of the uh, Pacific Northwest and Southeast Alaska and, and here in the Northeast, of course, you know, very different in, in many respects. And, you know, um, our trees do not typically live quite as long as um, some of the species out there. But I think a lot of people don't realize because we have so few examples out on the landscape that um, most trees, you know, um, in, here in, in, in New England will live to three, four, 500, even 600 years. Um, there are so few specimens, so few individual trees that are beyond uh, 100, you know, max 150 years. It's the very rare tree um, that has been, you know, uh, either on somebody's, in somebody's front yard or on the corner of a lot or on the edge of a field that's been allowed to grow, you know, so much older um, over, you know, time here. Um, but our forests, you know, one of the things that makes them so similar to uh, yours out there is that they have a thousand year interval between major disturbance events. And, and that's something that, you know, uh, I think a lot of people, you know, it gets, it gets a little wonky, but when you think about what makes our forest so unique here, it's that they can sequester and store carbon for incredible amounts of time. Um, if just given the chance to, to, uh, to grow old and, and to, to do what they do. Um, so we have, have an opportunity here, studies in Vermont have shown that we could store two to four times more carbon than is stored currently um, if we simply let forests grow older. And so um, just a, a huge opportunity to, to, as Mark was saying earlier, practice you know, proforestation, which is the term that's been used to uh, describe you know, letting, letting ecosystems work to their full ecological potential. Um, so uh, I, I wanna go to the Q&A though. I know that there's some questions that have come in and Mark, or Dan, do you want to jump in with uh, some of those? There's a couple. First of all, Natalie, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thank you so much for the work that you all did uh, in that uh, in that trek, um, both the beautiful parts and the painful parts that brought tears to, to your all's eyes and our eyes, too. Um, the Q&A box, Zach, is interesting. Questions keep going in and then they disappear on me. So here's one I think that, that is a good one. The question is, what's happened to the Tonga since the movie was made? Yeah, um, I would love to say that with a change in presidential administration, it's all better now, <laughs> uh, but I can't. Um, though the Forest Service has made a verbal commitment to reinvesting money in local communities and away from the timber program, there are still stand level timber projects moving forward, targeting old growth areas left on the Tongass National Forest. Um, however, we are hopeful that the agency itself, the Forest Service and the entire Department um, of Agriculture can use this opportunity in the Biden administration to reevaluate the way we value forests. And so in much of what Zach's been saying around climate and storing carbon, with this pivot to you know, the uh, national leadership looking at the impacts of climate change and what we can do. Um, and here we are sitting on national forests, our single greatest um, solution to natural, uh, for, for climate change. We have this opportunity to elevate forests in a new way. Um, so we're still working very hard on our advocacy. That's why these opportunities are so important because logging is still happening on the Tongass, even as we're simultaneously asking for the reinstatement of the roadless rule, which we do um, anticipate will happen soon. And, and, and I'll just add that, you know, um, it's fantastic that, you know, one of the I, I, it, Natalie is right that there hasn't been enough change administration to administration. And in fact, a lot of the bad projects that have been signed on the Green Mountain National Forest originated during the Obama administration. And so, um, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, persists no matter, you know, who is in office. And uh, it's the culture, unfortunately, of the agency to get out the cut. And um, our forests here in New England have reached silvicultural maturity which means that, you know, um, they are uh, really, you know, uh, 
top of mind for, for the loggers out there to get before they start to lose value. And you know, it means that we're kind of in this uh, moment here where we can, we can allow them to keep growing older to actually reach ecological maturity, which is a much different age, um, or we can you know, kind of cut them short. And so um, it's kind of a, a, a real, I don't know, juncture um, in, in, in management here. And we're lucky in Vermont that our delegation signed on to a letter recently calling for protection of mature and old growth forests across the US. Um, how that is defined and holding them accountable to it is another story altogether. And so it'll be up to all of us to hold our delegation to account on that and to make sure that other, other you know, uh, elected officials across the country you know, jo join in. Um, but uh, Mark, what, what else are people wondering about in, in the, in the Q&A? Well, there's a couple of things. And um, just, I wanna point out something that, that this picture behind me, this uh, used to be 40 and 50 year old trees in the Green Mountain National Forest that were recovering, you know, very young, but they were recovering. They've got no chance of it now when you look at what we have back there. Um, and Natalie, one of the things you said about the, the forests, you know, our, our best, best hope for uh, capturing carbon, the you know, natural solution, right? They're free. They do it every day and they don't cost us a penny and they do it for everybody. Okay. So some of the, uh, another question that's come in, several questions have come in about taking action. So one question in particular, you know, when action on the policy level doesn't work uh, and, and policymakers choose to ignore, um, you know, what the people want and continue to cut trees, what are the next steps for the public to do? So I think that question is to Natalie, okay, what, what are you all doing? Okay, uh, uh, what are you all gonna continue to do? Because that one comment period has closed. And then Zach, the other question is to you because a lot of people keep asking, well, what, what can we do now, right? So that I think that'll lead to our take action specific to Vermont and the Green, Nation, Green Mountain National Forest. So Natalie, maybe you first. Sure, I know it's, that's a hard question because it's like, oh, these comment periods close and, um, you know, and even then it doesn't matter, like, do legislators even listen? I live in a state where our congressional delegation is actively trying to log the Tongass um, and uh, privatize it. So our delegation isn't who I actually work with. So it's a, you know, it's a combination of Yes, reaching out to members of Congress at the state and federal level, because state legislators can make a difference in what a federal or congr national con delegation does. Signing on to letters, um, advocating through comment periods when those comment periods are open, but continuing to push the agencies even outside of comment periods is also very worthwhile. And then simultaneously reaching out to the individuals in agencies, sending them emails with your thoughts. And it seems like that goes out into the ether, but I, you know, and I'm talking from someone who came into this role at Audubon finding myself working with people who are now sitting in the Department of Interior and the Department of Agriculture as Biden appointees. And it, I never used to think that the letter writing mattered. And then I've now seen it does matter because those individuals are in positions of influence. And the only way they can take, to, take action is by using the rationale that they've heard from X number of people and X number of legislators. So all of our cumulative community action actually does make a huge difference. So if it's an issue you care about, it's worth reaching out to your legislators. It's worth writing letters, even if there's no actual comment period on a specific issue. And then following up with them, asking for a meeting with their in-state staff, making you a person to them and making your cause important through your person-to-person -person interaction is so important. And I'm not just saying that, I've actually like seen it make a huge difference. You just reach somebody and all of a sudden you get a response that you didn't think was possible. Yeah, and and you know here, um, sadly, for this is the reason standing trees exist is that for many years the uh, Vermont congressional delegation, and I'm pretty certain it's the same story in New Hampshire, um, hadn't heard from their constituents on issues related to you know wild public lands. Um, it had been a decade, we were told, since uh, the Vermont congressional delegation had had any meetings or any communication about these topics, which. I'm just going to say says something about the environmental community here, and we are here to wake them up. And I, you know, think it's happening uh, 
pretty quickly right now. Um, Standing Trees has been able to, um, you know, launch uh, pretty high profile efforts and, and um, educating lawmakers uh, left and right. And the reception has been really, you know, terrific so far. And so I think it, so much of this is about education as well. There's not much knowledge about what's going on on the ground. When people hear about what's going on in the Tongass, I think they're pretty stunned. When people hear about what's going on, that we're logging roadless areas on the White and the Green Mountain National Forest, both, um, you know, people are pretty stunned to hear that. These are the largest blocks of public lands um, in the Northeast, in, in New England anyways. And uh, they function as national parks in many respects. These are places that, you know, millions, tens of millions of people live within a day's drive of these areas. And, and they really function as places to get away from and, and, and seek that solitude. And people do not go there to uh, experience the devastation that's being you know, wrought right now um, in a lot of our wildest forests here. So um, it's, uh, you know, I really appreciate your, your comments there, Natalie. And, and it's inspiring and hopefully it'll you know, motivate some more folks who, if you have not taken action yet, uh, we'll put that petition back in the chat um, to reach out to the Vermont delegation and uh, hope you, that you'll, you'll make sure that you fill that out here this evening. Um, so uh, Mark, do you wanna throw out another question for us? Yeah, I'm sorry if it looks like I'm multitasking, I am. I'm trying to pay attention to questions and chats and everything else. Um, let's see, here's a question. Um, the subsidies that we as taxpayers supporting are making this industry possible. And is it the same with the biomass industry? If the subsidies did not exist, the biomass industry would die. Are there ideas to address ending these subsidies for what's happening uh, in the Tongass? And I would say, I'm gonna to add to that question in every national forest where they're uh, logging. So Natalie, I don't know if that's a question you're prepared to answer or not. Um, I can answer a little bit, and that is um, those subsidies are designated during the appropriations process, which happens every spring in Congress at the, at the national level, um, if we're talking about federal subsidies. And so during that process, um, for anyone who's been to D.C. during appropriation season, there's lobbyists and there's activists and advocates all over Washington, D.C. in a non-pandemic year. Now it's all done over Zoom, um, advocating for what they want or don't want in federal appropriations. And it's a really boring process of budgeting, you know, the federal government's budget. But it's so important because so many things get buried in appropriations and they start at the subcommittee level. So if you're looking at timber subsidies, you're looking at, you know, which subcommittees in the House and the Senate are putting together appropriations requests and trying to talk to legislators and get public comments in on the appropriations process and simultaneously working with agencies. So getting pressure, for putting pressure on the Forest Service so that they can't ask for that timber subsidy anymore. So it's that same advocacy we've just been talking about, but it's very funneled on the budget making process in the federal government. And all of this comes back to just that con consistent pressure on our elected officials and our agency representatives because they are part of all these processes and they get so many things thrown at them in the appropriation season that for some of them, they won't even see a budget line item for timber subsidies. I've, I've had lots of conversations with Congress, congressional offices all over the country that are like, what? I approved this subsidy. <laughs> um, and it's just like a matter of sitting down with them and saying, hey, look, this money is going to cut timber and have a few pictures with you to show like exactly what that subsidy is being used for can also be helpful. And, and here, you know, I'll just say on the biomass question, um, and I know that there's a lot of West Coast biomass, both in the US and British Columbia, that's also pellets that are being, uh, you know, uh, you know, where we're transforming in some cases, old growth forests into pellets for burning, which is uh, just astounding. And, and here, you know, we're doing much the same. Biomass um, is a, you know, a growing component of the energy sector and it's sailing under the radar because um, people are considering it to be carbon neutral, which is just insane. Um, and we know that biomass electricity releases one and a half times the amount of carbon as coal burning for the same amount of electricity. Um, when you harvest for biomass, you're much more likely to be stripping a forest of every last piece of that downwoody debris that is typically left behind after 
you know, logging operation, even making, you know, water quality issues and, and, and you know, uh, biodiversity issues worse. Um, and so, and you're foregoing all of the, cor of course, the sequestration that would have happened if you had left that, you know, forest intact. And so the, the, the you know, the, the issues with biomass are, are many and um, the incentives are huge. There's a lot of interest in producing pellets in the U.S. to ship over to Europe in particular, where they've converted a lot of coal-fired power plants to biomass electricity. And there's a danger that we're going to be really shifting towards more biomass here in the U.S. and, and more pellet production here in the Northeast. It's not a long uh, ride from here over to those European markets on a boat. So, you know, I think it's something that we need to be hyper aware of that the, the absolute destruction that's going on in southeastern U.S. forests in particular, um, down in the Carolinas, Georgia, um, where they are just leveling forests right now uh, to ship overseas, that could come our way if we're not careful about it. Um, and so it's, 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 it's a real concern. And, and I'm glad that uh, somebody asked about the biomass issue. Okay, I'm, I'm looking at time here and I'm trying to monitor the questions uh, and I'm trying to go from top to bottom here. Uh, there's a question about the study. Uh, can we post the study or article that talks about the evidence of increased, uh, how mature forests sequester more carbon than older forests? So Zach, if we, we can either post that or get that out to people, but that's, that's a good question. But I will just say, if you if people Google uh, Bill Mumal or proforestation, you will find some really good papers that he and his uh, other partners um, looking at how to change how we manage and take care of our forests have put out that gives just a ton of information, uh, easily readable information too, about the benefits of letting forests grow versus uh, versus uh, logging them and trying to manage them to, to uh, store more carbon. Um, I recommend folks go, go to the Standing Trees website. We actually have um, links to a lot of these studies on our site if you explore. Um, we're improving the site all the time and adding to it. Um, I just put up a, a, bi a big blog post about 30 by 30 in the Global Deal for Nature and this bill H606, which is moving forward in the Vermont State House, which would commit Vermont to it's not as, as, as visionary as I wish it was, um, but it's, it's a big improvement. It would be tripling the amount of wildlands in Vermont if this bill was passed. That would be the target to bring Vermont up to 10% uh, of the state in, in wildlands. Right now, 3% of Vermont is managed that way. So it's not the 30% or the 50% that E.O. Wilson you know, has been calling for all this time, but um, it would be a huge improvement on, on where we are today in, in Vermont. Um, and so H606 is a bill that, uh, again, uh, Chairwoman Amy Sheldon, Chair of the House Natural Resources Committee here introduced, and hope you'll go to that blog post and, and, and send in a comment to her and her committee. Um, but you'll find there uh, on our site a lot of these studies, um, and we can also provide and, and follow up with a lot more information, a whole library's worth of, of info. And there's a lot of great research that's gone on just right, focused right here on New England. Um, so we can definitely, definitely get that info out. Um, Zach, it's, uh, we were gonna try to wrap up at 8.30. Uh, do we have closing comments? We've got one more question that I could put out there. Um, so I'll leave, you all want one more question or do we wanna start wrapping up? No, go for it. This is one that comes up periodically and it's a very good question that, that um, I, I don't think we wanna to try to dodge it. It's a good question that needs to be answered and that is, uh, if we don't source our wood locally, okay, then where do we go to get our wood? Because we do need wood. We, we can't just uh, stop using it. Uh, and, and it does have benefits, okay? Um, so the question is, uh, you know, what's the middle ground between old growth and sustainable logging? It's kind of an open-ended question, okay? But I, I think it's one that, that uh, deserves some discussion. I can answer that from our perspective, which is, um, in fact, we did some short films before we launched Understory, one of them featuring Gordon Chu, who's a local mill operator in Southeast Alaska. And we've never really opposed those local mill operators that are doing selective harvesting um, of stands of trees, kind of using that wildlife, men wildlife habitat mentality and, 
and carbon storage mentality and stewardship of the land in the work that they're doing with, for, with uh, forestry uses in the region. However, 85% of the timber harvest in Southeast Alaska, and in some years it's up to 96%, is actually exported as a whole round log straight to Asia. So that ship that you saw in the film is a very common occurrence. We've actually tracked those ships. They come to Southeast Alaska to port, they load the logs and they go right back to Asia. Um, that has been happening for over 60 years on the Tongass. A significant amount of our lumber has actually been sunk in harbors um, off the coast of Japan um, by tarring the logs and sinking them into the water because the Japanese companies that used to own the pulp mills, because for many years, most of the trees in the Tongass were actually just pulped. Um, the Japanese companies that own the pulp mills would choose the biggest trees and they would ship them straight to Japan and sink them in their harbors, recognizing that at some point in the future, wood would be the incredible commodity. And so they were trying to save it as um, early as they could. So it's unfortunate, but what you're seeing in Southeast Alaska is not a local um, logging operation and the United States does actually not benefit from that wood, which may be the saddest part of the story of all. Um, and, and I'll just, you know, add in that, um, you know, the fact is we, we have to lower consumption of resources. That includes wood. We have to do a better job of reusing wood products. Um, we have to be more efficient and we have to shift towards what's called ecological forestry uh, much more. And, you know, forestry that, that uh, does a much better job of, of being selective, of mimicking natural disturbances. Um, and you know, here in, in New England and across the country, the vast majority of um, timber that's harvested comes from private land. And I think people don't realize this, that public lands provide a very, very small amount of the wood supply in, in uh, the United States. I mean, it's over 90% that comes off of private lands. And, and that's the case here in, in uh, Vermont, for example, as well. And so um, the role of our public lands I think is, is something very different from um, private lands where of course, you know, private landowners kind of have, have, have their say and, and how their land is managed oftentimes. On public lands, we can think for the long term. And that's not something that you can do very easily at scale um, or, you know, in terms of that kind of a timeline, thinking seven generations ahead um, on private lands. And the best example in the world, an example that we seem to have forgotten um, here in New England is, is you know, almost within sight. It is within sight if you live in, in, in uh, Burlington or along the, the east shore of Lake Champlain. Um, every night, the beautiful sun sets over the Adirondacks. And 125 years ago, the state of New York set the Adirondacks in motion to become what is today easily the largest expanse of, of really healthy forest um, in the, you know, northeast U.S. Um, and today, 10% of New York is managed as wild forest. And that's because of the vision of uh, lawmakers in the late 1800s, 1894, and uh, the you know that 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 constitutional amendment that created the Adirondack Forest Preserve um, is something that we still haven't caught up to here in in New England. And so um, you know, public lands have a different role to play, and it's kind of a false choice, I think, to put out there the notion that it's you know choosing between wood products and logging versus you know having healthy ecosystems, you know, to some degree, we can do it all. We have to be smart about where we do it and the intensity that we do it. Um, and I really think that, you know, the future is wild. Um, we're going to have a lot more wildlands um, in this part of the world and, and hopefully out in Natalie's part of the world too. So. Zach, if I could just add real quick, and then I think we, I think we do uh, want to wrap up. Um, but we talk about balancing old growth and sustainable forestry. Okay, so two things. Ground truthing, what you see behind me is not sustainable forestry, but that's what's happening in our federal and state lands. So that's not sustainable forestry. The two, when we talk about balancing, less than 1% of Vermont is old growth forest. So if we're talking about balancing, I think we've got a long way to go to get anywhere near a balance between old growth and sustainable forestry. So we really need to speak loudly and strongly in support of protecting what is remaining of old growth and protecting the forests that's recovering and could become old growth. Well, so 
to wrap up, Natalie, I just want to let you have the floor. What, what else, you know, would you like to add anything, you know, that you want to close with or um, go ahead. Um, sure, I'll just add that um, Alaska is pretty special in that we rely on the advocacy and activism of everyone in the country. Um, we're 65% public land up here and we have some of the the biggest amounts of public land. Um, a third of national public lands are in Alaska. So we all have a shared stake in what happens. And because of uh, the lack of state and federal leadership for Alaska, we rely on all of your advocacy efforts. And so it's, it's awesome to uh, share an evening with you. And I just want to thank you for all of the work that many of you have done on behalf of Alaska and our wild places and that you're doing in your home communities because the ethic that you steward where you live carries forward to the work that we do at the national and international level. So uh, thank you so much and uh, special thanks to Zach who is a dear friend and it's um, so lovely to spend an evening with you. Well, right back at you. Thank you to everybody um, who joined tonight. It's a really wonderful turnout and uh, please join us again, uh, March 24th uh, with Judy Dow, incredible Abenaki uh, leader and educator. Um, and you know, again, uh, don't let the night go by without filling out the petition um, and contacting our delegation and the forest supervisor of the Green Mountain National Forest. We'll have a similar petition running really soon for the White Mountain National Forest and for New Hampshire leaders. So please stay tuned. And thanks again for being a part of this Growing Standing Trees family and move, this movement for wild forests. Lastly, be there on Saturday, February 5th in Burlington for this rally. Um, we really need to show numbers and we'll do it safely outdoors together and, and excited to see you there. So th Natalie, thank you so much and have a good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.